When setting a royalty rate, any number of factors concerning the patent, the product, and the market come into consideration. Fortunately, others have done this before and have recorded factors that they felt were important. Rather than creating a mathematical formula that pops out a royalty rate number, these factors help inform and shape the conversation, whether it be in court or in a licensing meeting. One such set is referred to as the Georgia Pacific factors, after one of the parties in a long-running patent case. These factors continue to serve as a starting point to justify any royalty rate, whether in court or in a licensing meeting. The case is Georgia Pacific Corporation versus United States Plywood Corporation. It's worth downloading the decision and reading it, as in this video, I'll just identify the factors and comment on each. Note when downloading it, it's important to get the 1970 District Court decision, as there are other reported decisions in the case. The dispute began in the mid-1950s. In 1970, the District Court identified 15 factors that should be considered in determining a reasonable royalty rate. Those 15 factors were found from a survey of other such cases up to that date. At issue were three patents related to plywood. Note that this plywood was designed by a famous U.S. designer, Donald Desky, involved in the design of the Radio City Music Hall and industrial designs such as the original Joy detergent bottle. He has a U.S. postage stamp dedicated to his work. It was his patent that was upheld as valid and infringed. The infringer suggested that royalty rates should be a dollar and a half to three dollars per thousand square feet of plywood. The patent owner suggested that it should be fifty dollars per thousand square feet. It was up to the district court to determine what a reasonable royalty was for the patent. At the end of the day, the district court agreed that fifty dollars was appropriate, which was later reduced by an appellate court to thirty-five dollars and sixty-five cents per thousand square feet for a total award of five hundred seventy thousand dollars to the patent owner. Its methodology in doing so have been used ever since. The factors that are considered in that methodology are referred to as the Georgia Pacific factors. The court introduces the 15 factors with the following fanfare in the court decision. And as the case has become famous, it was probably appropriate. Let's go through these factors. I'm going to group some of the factors in a different order than listed by the court in this video. However, I'll keep the court's original number. This factor is not surprisingly the first to consider is there are already an established royalty rate for the patent. Established royalty rates are very probative, whether that royalty was set by a court or through a licensing negotiation. Patent owners frequently suggest that earlier negotiated royalty rates were set for reasons other than the value of the patent. For example, earlier licenses may have been granted at lower royalty rates because the patent owner was cash-strapped, or that the commercial value of the patent had not been established. A court or a potential licensee is welcome to consider that. This is an important factor as it indicates what the licensee actually has paid others. Today, this factor takes on another important consideration. Royalty stacking has become an issue as products now infringe more patents than ever. As more patentees assert their patents, a manufacturer needs to consider the cumulative effect of those licenses. In one case, Microsoft noted that with regard to its Xbox, dozens of other companies hold patents that have been declared essential to the standards in question, and if each of the others demanded similar royalties, the total royalty would exceed 50% of the end product price, and 3,000% of the relevant component value. This factor in a licensing negotiation needs to be broadened beyond the, what the licensee pays for similar patents. One should look at what other similar patents are licensed to for anyone, not just what the licensee has paid in the past. Royalty rates are hard to find when not in litigation. Most licensees are reluctant to disclose that information, as it is considered confidential business information. However, there are a few sources that people routinely go to. Reported rates and reported cases, annual reports and SEC filings, publicly reported rates identified by other licensors, such as MPEG-LA, rates identified in reports by professional organizations, such as the Licensing Executive Society, and rates identified by royalty rate reporting services or in published articles. The next three factors address the patent owner's use of the patent to maintain market share and its willingness or lack thereof to grant a license that would affect that market share, as well as the market share of the licensee. Factor three addresses exclusive licenses. Exclusive licenses are ones where there is only one licensee or one licensee in a particular market. 
This protects both the patent owner's market share as well as the licensee's market share. Exclusive licenses should cost more. It takes advantage of the ability to exclude others from the marketplace. With less competition, a seller can charge a higher sales price. Factor 4 addresses the patent owner's market share directly. Limits on a license can include restrictions as to customers or production limits. In that way, the patent owner can get royalty revenue for its inventions for sales to customers that it might not be able to sell to. And the patent owner might be able to get royalties when it does not have the production capacity to meet the demand. Factor 5 focuses on the specific relationship between the licensee and the patent owner for the same reasons as factors 3 and 4. A patent owner may lose sales when it licenses its competition. However, a patent owner can freely license a non-competitor and simply gain additional revenue for its own inventions. This is the case when the patent is used by the owner in one industry and by the licensee in another industry. Factor 6 addresses incidental benefits of the patent. Today, directly tying non-patented items with sales of a patented item can be an antitrust violation in some industries and situations. However, it is important to note that in cases such as computer printers, the printers are generally sold cheaply so that the ink can be sold at a profit. Similarly, Apple gives away its iTunes software, as does Amazon its readers, so that the consumer will buy products from its own stores. Note that neither of these companies licenses access to the product, music or books, in a format other than their own. These additional sources of revenue need to be protected in light of the patent protection that is available, and a coordinated effort to preserve market share needs to be created without violating antitrust laws. This factor is important in commercial licensing discussions. Long-term licensees sometimes get a discount. In that way, the licensor does not have to be renegotiated in the license many times over during the course of the patent's life. I'm going to combine factors 8 and 12. Both relate to profit. A manufacturer, even an infringer, needs to or is entitled to make a profit when setting a reasonable royalty. In some cases, the royalty rate may exceed the normal profit margin but the market will need to bear that pricing. As more patentees assert their patents, a manufacturer needs to consider the cumulative effect of those licenses. Recall the Xbox case, where the cumulative royalty rights might price a product out of the market. In the case of game consoles, a great deal of profit margin comes from the individual game sales. A high cumulative royalty rate on the consoles might price the console out of the market. Without console sales, there are no game sales. The same situation exists for printers. This factor is particularly important when the invention creates a truly new product. That happens in pharmaceutical cases, where a new drug may cure a previously incurable disease. These are the types of patents that command a very high royalty rate, often exceeding standard profit margins. Factors 10, 11, and 13 address the specific use of a patent and the apportionment of profit to a particular patent. Factor 10 addresses how the patent owner uses the invention. In some instances, this may be very different from others. For example, the patent owner may have an invention that it uses for automobiles, but the patent has application in other devices, such as aircraft engines. The value of the invention in one industry may be quite different from another industry. Factor 11 addresses actual instances of infringement. This was an issue in the Microsoft Lucent case. Microsoft's Outlook product has a feature that helps a user fill in forms that require a date. Rather than having to fill in the form with a date in a particular format, a calendar pops up. A user can pick a date on the calendar, and the form is automatically filled out in the proper format. Lucent asserted that it owned a patent with a claim covering that feature. Microsoft argued that Lucent had not shown evidence that anyone had actually used that date tool. A Microsoft attorney articulated this point well in an argument before the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Here's the audio of that argument. Lucent Technology versus Gateway. Good morning. Give the other side a few more seconds to get in place and then we'd like to begin. Council, good morning. Welcome to the court. Please proceed. But here, where it's undisputed that these products have hundreds of non infringing uses, you have to have some proof that somebody actually practiced the method. Well, the calendar doesn't have alternative uses, does it? The, the date picker tool uh, does not have alternative uses. That's correct, Your Honor. 
But there's no reason to, no reason, certainly no evidence that anybody ever used it. And you, you need that evidence. So I could, uh, in picking a date, either type in the date or use the tool uh, offered you can if type, I preferred. You can, so the former would be a non-infringing use. That's correct. You can type in the date. You could type in June 2nd, 2009. You could type in Christmas Day. You could type in uh, Valentine's Day. You could type in next Thursday. You could type in tomorrow. All of those will give you a date without using uh, the, the, uh, the calendar tool, the date picker. And, and, and you're saying that the product literature ads and so forth, instruction manuals and other such documents, don't specify using the uh, date picker tool that allows you to do it other than by typing in from the keyboard. No, I'm not saying that, Your Honor. What I'm saying is that there's, there, may, there very may well be uh, instructions on, on how to use the date picker tool, but that does not lead to the conclusion that somebody did it. You, you, have, to, you have to conclude that somebody actually did it, and instruction, it, it's like, I think we use the example in our brief, if you have a, a map with multiple trails uh, and one of them goes through somebody's property and would, would cause you to trespass if you used it, you, you have to prove that the person actually used that trail. The fact that the instruction to use it was there doesn't prove that it happened. And there's no proof here that it happened. And that's the fundamental problem. The, uh, uh, and when you, when you get past that, Your Honor, and then to turn to, to finally answer your question, Judge Lurie, uh, the the award numerically may be I didn't I haven't done the math but it certainly is in the range between Microsoft's figure of six point five million and, and Lucent's figure of I think somewhere in the neighborhood of seven hundred million but the fact that a, a number is lower than the number the plaintiff throws out there doesn't mean it's supported by the record uh, here the only conceivable basis for this number. Uh, is, the, is the value of the Microsoft products, the Outlook sales, money sales, Windows mobile sales. Uh, and even if this is some sort of a split the difference uh, kind of calculation by the jury, still they, that, that means they use the entire market value because that was the, the, the one end of the range that if, if they were splitting the range, that's what they were doing. So either way, you, you've got the entire market value rule implicated here. Uh, the only other basis... Well, the entire, entire market value rule, the, the sales base is, is related to the amount of royalty. So <coughs> if, uh, if you're using a smaller base, then a, a higher royalty may, may fit. If you have a larger base, uh, a lower royalty. And well, well that's, that's true as a matter of arithmetic, Your Honor, but, but doctrinally, I don't think that approach, which, which incidentally is the approach Lucent's damages expert essentially said he was using a trial. It, you, know, you, can, you can make one big and one small or do it the other way and get the same number. But I think the case law is very clear that there's a distinction between the two. While they're certainly related, and, and again, as a matter of arithmetic, you can get to the same place. Doctrinally, that's not the Factor right approach. Factor 13, in part, has become what is now called the entire market value rule and or apportionment. In fact, it can easily be read as follows. The Microsoft Lucent case addresses this issue, too. Here's the Microsoft attorney again. Later in the same year, you only look the at Court of Appeals the, the total Federal product Circuit. revenues as the base if you satisfy the requirements of the entire market value rule, which is uh, the accused feature or component or whatever it is uh, somehow drove demand for the product. Uh, most of the cases say uh, was the basis for demand. Some cases suggest a substantial factor, but in either event, it clearly had to have a substantial influence on demand. What do you think uh, is really required? That it be the primary cause of the demand or more than a trivial cause of the demand or one of six major causes of the demand? Where, where do we end up here? Well, Your Honor, uh, let me answer in two parts. First of all, in this case, I don't think you need to confront that issue because there's no evidence that it was one of six, one of 600. Uh, there is simply no evidence linking demand for these products to this feature. And why was it included? It, well, Your Honor, it was included years ago before there was any awareness uh, of this patent. Uh, you, you know, there are, there are hundreds of features in these software products. If they're nice. Maybe somebody will use them. Maybe, you know, most people probably don't. Uh, there was no reason to take it out. When, Is your answer to the Chief's question that, that if there are six features, then perhaps uh, uh, the damages should be calculated based on one-sixth 
Or no. you factor in the significance of the one, which may be uh, the basis uh, for the demand for the product that may have been much more valuable than the other five? Well, I, th I think it, it's not a question of counting up how many features there are and taking that fraction. I think you have to look at the particular feature at issue and say, did this, in some sense, create the value of the product? Wasn't there some testimony, whether it had a basis, another matter, but wasn't there some testimony that the uh, demand for Outlook did come from the claimed date picker, et cetera, features? No, Your Honor. Factor 14 is important in court cases. In court, experts are routinely retained to testify. This is another issue that courts are paying attention to today. Indeed, experts are being disqualified for not using the Georgia Pacific factors in their expert reports. Finally, this is the ultimate question for any court. What would an actual negotiation arrive at? If one can find evidence of that, then it's a great evidence in a litigation environment. As a practical matter, many commercial licensing negotiations are done after the infringement has started. In many cases, neither the infringer nor the patent owner is aware of the infringement at the time it begins. Once infringement is discovered, the parties then begin to meet with each other in an attempt to resolve the issue without going to court. Patent owners seeking to avoid costly litigation frequently discount past infringement, both because the patent laws require notice to an infringer of the infringement before patent damages begin to accrue and to accommodate an infringer who has not yet had an opportunity to build the royalty rate into its price structure. I have two short notes to complete this video. The first one relates to FRAND or RAND licensing. Industry standard essential patents and patent pools containing those patents are the subject of a number of cases and commentary over the past few years. FRAND licensing is short for fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory. RAND licensing terms are only reasonable and non-discriminatory. The idea behind these type of agreements is to stop participants who create industry standards from driving the technical standard into their own patents, and then effectively excluding others from using the now industry standard by charging excessive royalties. At the end of the day, these cases are important. However, commercially, I would note that many license royalty rates should be framed. Otherwise, you'll end up in an expensive lawsuit where the court grants royalty rate that may not be all that different from a FRAND license. Courts are not in the business of handing out unfair licensing royalty rates. The patent statute only allows for a reasonable royalty. It's fundamentally an issue of whether there be an exclusive or discriminatory license or not. The FRAND or RAND issue is not an issue in the Georgia Pacific case, but the factors that are used in considering such terms are Factor 3 addresses whether or not it's an exclusive or discriminatory license. And Factor 10 can address the issue of whether a patent is essential or not. One final note. The Georgia Pacific case identified 15 factors to consider when setting a royalty rate. Since then, any number of articles and methods have been suggested by scholars and experts. 100 factors were identified in one of my favorite articles from 1987. The article itself has been cited in a number of later studies. The article identifies factors that might be more relevant in a carrot license situation. However, the list is complete enough to stimulate a broader discussion of factors than the Georgia Pacific case does alone. The takeaway point is that one should always consider the Georgia Pacific factors. They're the industry standard, if you will. However, lists of factors can be found in articles, journals, and in later cases. Having a list of those on hand when setting and supporting a royalty rate is a good practice. Thanks for watching, and I hope this helps.